Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence their cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. Please also be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you'll be asked to leave. If you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the road to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Councilor Flynn. Present. Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, yeah. and Councilor Worrell. Yeah. Quorum is present. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Before we introduce the, the clergy, um, on behalf of my colleagues in this body, I want to apologize to the public and those that are that are here and those that are watching on television for our late start, unacceptable. This week's clergy is Rabbi Dessler from the Bias Yokov of Boston, invited by Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, would you like to come to the podium to introduce our clergy for today? Thank you, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it is my pleasure. It's my pleasure today to introduce Rabbi Haim uh, Dessler. Dessler, originally from Cleveland, Cleveland, Rabbi Haim Dessler is married to a third-generation Bostonian, and is proud to be raising a fourth generation of his family in Boston. Rabbi Dessler is one of the rabbis who leads the Bas Yaakov School in Boston, the only all-girls Jewish high school in the city. Bas Yaakov is located in Brighton and provides a college prep curriculum to girls in grades 9 through 12. Rabbi Dessler serves as the Director of Development at Bas Yaakov. He frequently collaborates with Adua, Aguda, how do I pronounce that? Aguda Israel. Aguda Israel, and local synagogues to strengthen and grow the Jewish community in Boston. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you here this morning, this afternoon, Rabbi Dessler, and thank you for uh, coming to lead us in prayer today. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a true honor and pleasure to join the distinguished Boston City Council, and I'm appreciative to Councilor Breeden for the invitation. I'd like to share a brief insight, and we'll close with words of prayer. In two weeks from tonight, Jewish people from all over the world will be celebrating the holiday of Passover, the holiday of freedom, and sit down at their Seder tables, joined together with family and friends. The table will be set with their finest and most beautiful 
china, crystal, and silver, and it will be adorned by the well-known items of Passover tradition, the matzah, the wine goblets filled to the top, the bitter herbs, the mortar-like haroses, and many more items, each with its rich symbolism. Each person around the table will have a very special book in hand called the Haggadah, which contains the story of Passover, the story of the Jewish people. The story begins in true sadness, a people enslaved by an oppressive regime, one which seeks to inflict its corrupt will on an innocent and helpless people. With Almighty God providing Moses direction at each step, Moses confronts the oppressive Pharaoh and proclaims, let my people go, only to be furiously turned down. He then begins to dispatch God's supernatural 10 plagues, one by one, gradually weakening the oppressors until Pharaoh can no longer stand up to God's power and expels them from his land. Slaves no more, they hastily bake matzah and set on their way. Experiencing countless miracles along the way, culminating to one of history's most remarkable miracles and events, the splitting of the Red Sea, the Jewish people cross the sea and begin to gel as a new found nation, born out of freedom, united under Almighty God. Freedom, a spiritual and physical freedom, a social and emotional freedom, to observe our faith and to, live, and to live our lives as we please. This is the story we have told and retold for close to 3,500 years. And we come together on Passover to think about and imagine those times of challenge and of the great salvation. We do it each year to serve as a reminder that even when we have challenges and when times are dark, we know that salvation is not too far away. Today we are living in times where our very own safety and security is being threatened by those around us. Anti-Semitism is spiraling out of control, creating fear instead of freedom. Freedom is always within our grasp. Freedom to live our lives as we please, to believe as we wish. This is a hallmark of the Jewish nation, and this is the hallmark of the United States of America. This is a hallmark of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and this is a hallmark of this great city of Boston, a city where freedom and opportunity lives and thrives. Master of the world, with your infinite wisdom, you have commandeered the universe through each and every generation, through times of challenge and times of blessing. Times when truth and justice and justice was hard to see, and times when it has been clear and apparent. We beseech your great mercy that we merit continuous blessing and endless truth and justice. May you bestow us with blessings of continuous freedom, freedom for all of humanity, freedom to live, freedom to worship, freedom to educate, freedom to raise our families with values we hold true, freedom from hate, freedom from division, freedom of mind, and freedom of spirit. Almighty God, we ask you to bestow your bounty of blessings on the dedicated public servants of this great body who have stood up to carry out the mission of service. We ask you to protect and inspire these remarkable individuals, endow them with courage, fortitude, and wisdom, crown them with humility and compassion, and infuse them with the concepts of growth and renewal to lead us all forward. Please bless them, their families, and their staff, as well as each and every one of the nearly 700,000 Boston strong, with good health and prosperity, safety and security, happiness and tranquility, and perhaps a few more sports titles. And to this we say, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Thank you, Rabbi, for those inspiring words, and welcome to the Boston City Council. Mr. Clerk, will you ensure the record is reflected that Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, and Councillor Louis Jean are present? We're on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor the mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0606? Docket number 0606, message and orders for your approval. An ordinance adopting the Department of Energy Resources Municipal Opt-in Specialized Stretch Energy Code. Thank you. This docket 0606 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0607206610, please? Docket number 0607, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $17,535,525 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 23 Community Development Block Grant awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Housing. The grant will fund housing, economic development, and social services programs. The award amount is estimated from prior years. Docket number 0608, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $6,235,976 in the form of a grant from, for the Federal Fiscal Year 23 Home Investment Partner Grant awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Housing. The grant will fund the production of new affordable rental and home ownership housing and also provide operating support for community development corporations. The award amount is estimated from prior years. Docket number 0609, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $3,734,533 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 23 Housing for Persons with AIDS, HOPWA, awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Housing. The grant will fund services for income-eligible individuals and families affected by AIDS. The award amount is estimated from prior years. And docket number 0610, Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,517,966 in the form of a grant for the Federal Fiscal Year 23 Emergency Solutions Grant awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Housing. The grant will fund the Street Outreach Emergency Shelter Homelessness Prevention rapid rehousing assistance and shelter services. The award amount is estimated from prior years. Thank you. These dockets 0607206610 will be referred to the Committee on Housing, Community Development. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0611206612, please. Docket number 0611, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $100,000 in the form of a grant for the Recycling Dividend Program awarded by the Mass Massachusetts Environmental Protection Division to be administered by the Public Works Department. The grant will fund curbside recycling and other programs and policies proven to maximize reuse, recycling, and waste reduction. Docket number 0612, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an in-kind donation of winter accessories and toys valued at $10,000 donated by Recreation, Recreational Equipment, Inc., REI, located at 401 Park Drive, Boston, Mass. 02215. The grant will support PlaySHED, a mayor's office of new urban mechanics placemaking pilot to bring delight to our public spaces and expand access to recreational toys and equipment. Thank you. These dockets 
One shall will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, <coughs> Technology. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0613. Docket number 0613, message transmitting certain information under section 17F relative to the BTU member overpayment. Docket number 0506, passed by the Council on March 1st, 2023. Thank you. This docket 0613 will be placed on file reports of public offices and others. Mr. Clerk, <coughs> please read docket 0614 to 0624, please. Docket number 0614, communication was received from Maureen Joyce, City Auditor, regarding the City of Boston's fiscal 2022 annual comprehensive financial report. Docket number 0615, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Joseph D. Feaster, Jr as a member and chairperson of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0616, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Denilson Fanfan as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0617, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Lemershi Frazier as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0618, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of George Greenwich Jr. as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0619, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Dr. Kerry Gr Greenwich as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0620, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Dr. David Harris as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0621, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Dorothea Jones as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0622, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Carrie Mays as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. In docket number 0623, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Letitia Mills as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Docket number 0624, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Damani Williams as a member of the task force on the study on City of Boston reparations, effective immediately. Thank you. Docket 0614 through 0624 will be placed on file reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0133. Docket number 0133, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on January 11, 2023. Docket number 0133, Home Rule Petition Authorizing Additional Restricted Liquor Licenses, submits a report recommending that the Home Rule Petition ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the Chair of Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Committee on Government Operations held a working session on March 9th, 2023 on docket 0133, petition for a special law regarding authorizing additional restricted liquor licenses, sponsored by Councilors Brian Worrell, Rusi, Louis Jen, and myself. I would like to thank my Council colleagues for attending, Council President Ed Flynn, <laughs> Councilors Aaron Murphy, Brian Worrell, Lucy Louis Jen, Councilor Michael Flaherty, Councilor Gabriella Coletta. Uh, I would also like to thank members of the administration for their participation. Shigana Duwu, Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion for the City of Boston, and Danny Green, Executive Secretary for the Licensing Board for the City of Boston, as well as Leslie Hawkins, partner for Prince LaBelle, for her input and in legal analysis. Lastly, I'd like to thank the Boston Black Hospitality Coalition and Nick Korn, President of, uh, pre sorry, Principal of offsite for their work and advocacy on this matter. This home rule petition as filed would authorize the licensing board for the city of Boston to grant up to three all alcohol liquor licenses and two malt and wine licenses for specific neighborhoods by zip code. These licenses would be rolled out over a period of five years. The licenses would be non-transferable and restricted to those zip codes. During the working session, the committee made language changes to ensure consistency with state law 
and we also discuss language changes to clarify when the licenses will start to be given out and the intent of this the and the intent of this legislation so that all of the licenses will be distributed and carried over and not lost if not granted in a particular year in other words the licenses roll over if there's five issued in one year but only three are selected then that next year that zip code would have seven available to it uh, during the working session, the committee made language changes to ensure consistency with state law. And we also discussed language changes to clarify when the licenses will start to be given out and the intent of this legislation so that all licenses will be distributed and carried over and not lost if not granted in a particular year. Passage of this legislation in its amended draft provides clarity and will ensure that the intent of the legislation is met and will provide economic opportunity to potential restaurant owners and equity among neighborhoods that are lacking establishments with alcohol or beer and wine licenses by tying the licenses to specific zip codes. Having such establishments is important to the economic vitality of the neighborhoods and contributes in a, to a positive quality of life for the residents by providing, providing places to gather and socialize with family and neighbors. Uh, the, I believe, 2017 Boston Public Health Commission study on the health of Boston actually saw that one of the butterfly effects to uh, poor health was the lack of liquor licenses in a neighborhood, leading to a lack of sit-down restaurants in a neighborhood and, the, and a different quality and level of food available to those neighborhoods as the businesses in those neighborhoods cater to a fast food uh, sort of uh, uh, fare rather than a sit-down restaurant uh, atmosphere. And so. There's an actual butterfly effect to liquor licenses and community health. Uh, and as chair for the Committee on Government Operations, I recommend that this docket ought to pass in this new draft. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Royal. Council Royal seeks acceptance. The chair recognizes Council Royal. Council Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I uh, want to thank my co sponsors, Council Louis Jen, uh, Council Royal, and advocates like. The Boston Black Hospitality Coalition, Nick Korn from Offsite, Leslie Hawkins, Steve Miller, and Dennis Quilty, um, and administrative representatives like D Danny Green, Kathleen Joyce, and Chief Edewu. I also want to acknowledge that this work builds off of the legacy of our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and her leadership on liquor licenses during her time on the council. And I know Council Baker also did some work on liquor licenses as well. Uh, we are working within the guardrails of an antiquated system that has systemically uh, limited black and brown communities to accumulate assets and wealth, and this is why this home rule petition is so crucial, as it will start providing the tools our black and brown restaurant owners need to create vibrant business districts and neighborhoods that have been left out for, too, for far too long. Uh, Mattapan has only eight out of the total 1,090 on-premise liquor licenses, and Blue Hill Lab wants a thriving commercial district, an historic home of Boston's black community and immigrant population has only six. Uh, when you compare that to other neighborhoods that have 80 like Back Bay, the disparity sent a clear message. And when you look at the profit generated by those liquor licenses, two times the profit, it further deepens the gaps in opportunities and wealth our communities already fill. Although this isn't the overall we are all looking for, uh, this home group petition is the first step. Uh, it gives Mr. Eddie, uh, who has only done takeout in Dorchester and Hyde Park for 19 years, the opportunity to start to provide sit-down services and a getting stout with some oxtail and curry goat. Uh, it gives Daz Restaurant in Hyde Park, who is loved by so many here in Boston, to now be able to serve a Don Julio Resp Resposado Neat, my favorite, in their establishment, and also gives me and my neighbors the ability to now spend more money in our community, creating a pipeline of operators who will start reinvesting in their own neighborhoods. Uh, Boston has long advertised itself as a city of neighborhoods, and it's time that we break down the barriers that pre prevent residents from Eagle Hill to Blue Hill from developing into destinations for tourists and residents alike. Uh, this is the step in ensuring we have more liquor licenses in the hands of black and brown businesses, and I ask my colleagues for their vote. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Rell. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd like to thank um, Council Rell for his leadership on this issue. As well, he said a lot, but many of our neighborhoods, as we know, uh, too often our black and brown neighborhoods have suffered from decades of structural disinvestment. We also know that the city of Boston holds the power to give licenses for certain economic activity, such as running a restaurant or bar, and who can have a successful restaurant or bar has largely depended on who has political connections, a social capital, financial capital, um, to get a liquor license. Uh, last year, we filed a, a home rule petition that was successful to get liquor licenses for the bowling building and for the Strand Theater, um, and this is another piece of the puzzle. This home rule petition is about creating more business of color. It's about creating a local thriving economy in our neighborhoods, where my colleague, where my council colleague. 
Pasoral could get his Don Julio uh, Rapasado knee um, and without having to go downtown. It's about one piece of the puzzle to fix historic injustice. The ability to serve alcohol can be a spur for economic success of not only a restaurant, but also for an entire community. We see how that's happened in Hyde Park with Park 54. Uh, one coffee shop can turn into one more restaurant, can turn into one more bar, can turn into a thriving Main Street, can turn into a hub of economic activity, an attractive place for businesses to invest, from Mattapan to East Boston and everywhere in between. So I also encourage my colleagues to join me in passing this home rule petition. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. Council Royal seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0133 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll, roll call vote on docket number 0133. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Lara. Yes. Council Lara. Yes. Council Louisen. Yes. Council Louisen. Yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy. Yes. And Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell. Yes. Docket number zero one three three has received a unanimous vote in the affirmative. Thank you. This docket has passed in a new draft. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket zero four five three. And 0516, please. Docket number 0453, ordinance amending the City of Boston Code, ordinances section 7 3, Bay Village Historic District. And docket number 0516, petition for a special law re regarding an act to make certain changes in the law relative to the historic Beacon Hill District. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. The Committee on Government Operations held a meeting, uh, or a hearing rather, on Monday, March 20th on docket 0453, an ordinance amending the City of Boston Code Ordinances <laughs> Section 73, Bay Village Historic District, and docket 0516, petition for a special law regarding an act to make certain changes in the law relative to, uh, relative to the historic Beacon Hill District, sponsored by uh, Councilors Bach and Flynn, I would also like to thank uh, my council colleagues for attending, Councilor Rusi louis Jan and Councilor Aaron Murphy. I would also like to thank the administration for attending, Chief Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, Chief of Environment, <coughs> Energy, and Open Space for the City of Boston, and Nicholas Armada, Senior Preservation Planner at the Landmarks Commission for the City of Boston. Docket number 0453 is an amendment to the ordinance establishing the Bay Village Historic District and makes two minor updates to exemptions from the authority of the district's commission based on recommendations from the Historic District Commission and the Neighborhood Association in order to ensure a more cohesive review of matters regarding historical and architectural developments in the district. Docket number 0516 is a home rule petition that relates to the providing an extension of the Beacon Hill District to include several areas not initially included in the Enabling Act, specifically extending the Beacon Hill District down, to the, down the north slope of Beacon Hill to Cambridge Street. This extension would bring the historic buildings to, on the north slope under the architectural protections afforded by the historic district. The petition would also give the Beacon Hill Architectural Commission the specific authority to levy fines for violations of the historic preservation rules and closes a loophole exempting additional reconstruction after exempted reconstruction due to a public safety need. Following the discussion at the hearing, the committee made the following changes to docket number 0516, which expands <coughs> the amendment in section three by striking and replacing section 9 of chapter 616 of the Acts of 1955 in full in order to include an exemption for the sidewalks on the south side of Cambridge Street. This amendment would remove any unintentional barriers for the city in the case of necessary street redesign. These two pieces of legislation will update the authority of the historic district commissions in Bay Village and Beacon Hill to address concerns and suggestions of the commission members, city officials and residents that reflect the balance and the need for ongoing preservation, city planning and public safety in the historic districts. As chair of the committee on government operations, I recommend that docket 0453 ought to pass and recommend that docket 0516 ought to pass in an amended draft. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Royal. 
The chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, um, and I'll be brief. I just want to thank Councillor Arroyo um, for holding this hearing and uh, for his recommendations today, and um, thank folks from Beacon Hill and Bay Village, um, both on the, commit on the Historic Commission side, on the Neighborhood Association side, and everybody who showed up and testified at the hearing on Monday. Um, I think that, uh, as mentioned, the Bay Village changes are very small um, related to design authority, and then the uh, Beacon Hill ones, if you look at the current map, as I discussed with the chair, it kind of, it looks like an error the way that it cuts off to not cover the last 40 feet um, of the block up to Cambridge Street. And so I think um, the modification that was made by the chair just to ensure that in getting us down to that Cambridge Street line, we don't um, create an issue with, you know, when we get the red blue connector and kind of thinking about how to have the street um, be maximally well redesigned and cohesive and accessible um, is, a, is a good um, exclusion that got added in. So really uh, cheerful about both these um, moving today. And uh, thank you also, Mr. President, um, to you for co-sponsoring these with me. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Bach, and um, thank you, Councilor Bach, for your important leadership on both of these dockets, as, as well as Councilor Arroyo as well. Um, the only thing I'll add to what you said, Councilor Bach, is I'm proud to represent the Bay Village and parts of the Beacon Hill neighborhood as well. Wonderful people, wonderful constituents. Council of Royal seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0453. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0453 is passed. Council of Royal seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0516 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Doubt the vote. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket 50516. Council Arroyo? Yes. <clears throat> Council Arroyo? Yes. Council Baker? Council Bach? Yes. Council Bach? Yes. Council Braden? Yes. Council Braden? Yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Coletta? Yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Council Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Council Flaherty? Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Lara? Council Lara, yes. Council Luzen, yes. Council Luzen, yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 0516 has received a unanimous vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This docket has passed in a new, dra new draft 0516. Council Block, did you want to? Um, Revisit docket 0453 for a um, voice vote. No, it's fine, Mr. President. It's because okay. 0453 is not a home rule petition. It, it's just a change to a city ordinance, so we're fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Council Bach, and again, thank you, Council Royal. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0138, 0139 together. Docket number 0138, ordinance regulation and enforcement of keeping honeybees, and docket number 0139 text amendment to the Boston Zoning Code with respect to honeybees. Thank you. The, the <coughs> chair recognizes Council of Royal, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. The neighborhoods have really been buzzing about this one, so I'm glad to get this on the floor today. <laughs> the Committee on Government Operations <laughs> held a hearing on Monday, March 20th on docket number 0138. Ordinance Regulation and Enforcement of Keeping Honeybees and Docket 0139, Text Amendment to the Boston Zoning Code with respect to honeybees, sponsored by Councilors Louis Jen, Bach, and myself. I'd like to thank my council colleagues for attending, Councilor Aaron Murphy, uh, Council President Ed Flynn, and Councilor Gabriella Coletta. I'd also like to thank members of the administration for their attendance, Chris English, who is the Chief of Staff at the Inspectional Services Department for the City of Boston, and Shani, uh, Shani Fletcher, Director of Grow Boston for the City of, of Boston. I would also like to thank the advocates for their participation as well, Val Mayo, uh, Val Mayo rather, Vice President of the Boston Area Beekeepers, Bill Perkins, owner of the Agricultural Hall, Noah Wilson-Rich, President of Best Bees, and Larry Van Deventer, board member of the Boston Area Beekeepers, and Jim Kirker, a beekeeper in my district. Uh, docket number 0138 seeks to create a new ordinance under Chapter 16, Section 127 of the City of Boston Code for the regulation and enforcement of keeping honeybees. This ordinance specifies the maximum number of hives on a given lot or roof for personal consumption of honey products, or honey bee products rather, and details the amount of feet a hive can be placed from a butter, sidewalk, and or roof. This ordinance also gives authority to the Inspectional Services Department and Animal in Control to enforce all violations or exceptions. 
Docket 0139 is a text amendment and acts as a counterpart to Docket 0138. This matter would remove B regulations from the City of Boston zoning code and place them in a municipal ordinance. Both of these matters would grant the City of Boston the authority to lift beekeeping bans in every neighborhood while maintaining rules for beekeepers to abide by. This hearing was productive as it gave the committee an opportunity to hear from the administration on the feasibility of this ordinance, as well as the steps for its implementation. The committee also heard from advocates on their invaluable experience working with bees and their working and move this and their work in moving this policy forward in previous years. As chair of the Committee of Government Operations, I recommend keeping this matter in committee as we await further language suggestions and recommendations from both the administration and advocates. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, President Flynn. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Just quickly, because uh, Councilor uh, Arroyo uh, summed it up, I just wanted to give credit to this. The reason how this issue came before us was because of State Representative uh, Rob Consalvo, former member of this body. So, want to give him a heads up, uh, 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 a thank you, uh, alongside uh, the High Park advocates, because this would not this would not have been here but for State Rep. Rob Consalvo. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo. <coughs> Docket 0318, 0319 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0334. Docket number 0334, order for a hearing regarding winter placemaking in Boston as a winter city. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Coletta, the Chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, we held a public hearing just yesterday um, that was first sponsored by Councilor Kendra Lara and referred to the committee on February 1st, 2023. I'm grateful for the councilors uh, in attendance. Um, uh, lead sponsor, Councilor Lara, Council President Ed Flynn, Councilor at Large Aaron Murphy, and Councilor Kenzie Bach. We were joined by members of the administration, including Amy Mahler, who is an Applied Policy Fellow from the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, Commissioner Ryan Woods from Parks and Recreation, Director Alicia Porcina from the Small Business Office, uh, Director John Borders IV um, from the Mayor's Office of, uh, of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment. Uh, we had a robust discussion on, on how we can make Boston a beautiful, um, vibrant city, even in the winter months. And uh, we identified a few, um, a few avenues to, to move forward. And, and residents definitely mentioned that they were interested in outdoor activities post-holiday, pre-spring. So looking at the months of January, February, and March. Um, Commissioner Woods mentioned the ideas of holiday lights. Um, with climate change, the, the weather being um, uh, uh, completely unpredictable and not really knowing whether or not we'll have or we'll be able to have an ice rink that won't melt or we won't be able to have um, activities directly dealing with snow because of the fact that we've been dealing with such mild, um, much, uh, much mild weather. Um, there was also conversation about uh, leveraging community partnerships and existing infrastructure to create activity uh, throughout all of the seasons prioritizing equitable access to our winter activities uh, that support communities um, and really connect folks across uh, all racial and socioeconomic groups. Um, I would like to uh, cede my time to the lead sponsor if she would like to add anything else. But as chair of this committee um, uh, of arts and culture, I recommend that at this time, this matter remain in committee for a future conversation with Public Works and uh, uh, the Arts and Culture Department and Transportation present. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clara. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you so much to Councillor Coletta for chairing that hearing and to all of my council colleagues for attending. I think what was made very clear to me during the hearing is that we have good bones and a good foundation to really be able to take the steps that we need to make Boston a winter city. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to having a couple of more hearings with other stakeholders at the administration and some community members so we can figure out what is the best way to move forward. But I think that we as you know, a northeastern city can really take leadership from other cities, not just in this country, but in Canada, who have really taken winter placemaking um, by the horns and made it happen for their constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. Um, this talk at 0334 will remain in committee. Just want to acknowledge Council Clara, Council Laura. It was an excellent meeting yesterday and very, very informative. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0244, please? Docket number 0244, order for a hearing on establishing a mental health curriculum in Boston public schools. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia, the chair of the Committee on Education. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and uh, yesterday, the Committee on Education held a public hearing on docket uh, 0244, in order for a hearing on establishing a mental health curriculum in Boston Public Schools. This matter was sponsored by me, Councillor Julia Mejia, and was referred to the Committee on Education on January 25th, 2023. I want to thank uh, the councillors who participated, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Coletta, Councillor President Ed Flynn, Councillor Anderson, and Councillor Louis Jen. I want to also thank the administration officials, Joe Carter, who is the Senior Executive Director of the BPS Office of Health and Wellness, Cheryl Tedesco, the Director of uh, Health Education in the Office of Health and Wellness, Jenna Parafinzak, who is the Director of Student Support at the BPS Division of Student Supports, and Dr. Simon, who is the Chief Behavioral Health Officer for the Boston Public Health Commission for attending the hearing and making a presentation and responding to questions from counselors. I want to thank the community and institutional advocates that presented as panelists, Dr. Gail Crumpswaby, President of New Generation and Associates, Dr. Jackman, founder of Inno Psych um, Incorporated, and John Reardon, who is with the Boston Children's Hospital, and Carla Haynes, who is the coordinator for the Mental Health Ambassadors Program at the Boston Project uh, Ministries. I also want to uplift and thank our young people who participated in the hearing, Maya, Maya McNeil, Weslyn Gonzalez, and Cheryl DePina. We had an opportunity to discuss how schools and um, can implement mental health practices that are free of cost to BPS, as well as the need for expanding access to counselors in our schools. Um, we also talked about the importance of understanding that when we're trying to create change here in the city of Boston, change is difficult to make. Um, and we understand that we have DESI to contend with and other um, uh, bureaucracy areas of, of, of point of tension for us to move the work forward. However, um, given the fact that so many of our young people are suffering in silence, I think it's really important for the Boston Public Schools to be able to seize this moment and make some deep investments in mental health and wellness. I don't think it should just be in some schools or in some classrooms or at some times. I think it needs to be something that we make a commitment, K through 12, no matter where our students are at, that there is an investment in the mental health and wellness of our children. You know, we tend to slide with the social and emotional learning. I understand that that is also part of the conversation, but if we're really serious about mental health, then we're gonna need to name it as such, mental health. And create a culture that it is okay to not be okay. And so with that, I'd like to keep uh, this hearing um, in, in committee and look forward to uh, doing the good work. The last thing that I'd like to just uplift is that the Burke, in partnership with our office, has created a mental health and wellness ambassadors program. And through that work, um, we are learning a lot from our young people who are uh, not only identifying their own triggers, but also helping to support their peers to the supports that they need. And in doing that, we're also building a workforce development pipeline so that we can have more young people pursuing this as a career option. So this is an opportunity for the city um, to not just look at this conversation through the lens of education, but also an opportunity for workforce development. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Docket 0244 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, resolutions. Mr. Quirk, please read docket 0625, please. Docket number 0625, Councilors Braden and Louisiane offer the following. Ordinance establishing a scofflaw property owner list. Thank you, the chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move to suspend the rules to add Councillor Bach as a co-sponsor, please. Hearing no objection, Councillor Bach is added. The Chair recognises Councillor Braden. This proposed ordinance builds off a hearing I sponsored with Councillor Bach and then Councillor Edwards in November of 2021 to review uh, rental unit condition standards and inspections. At that time, we discussed processes for tenants to report their living conditions that are out of compliance and systems to track owners who simply choose to pay fines while chronically neglecting to improve living conditions for their tenants. Our, invent our invited panelists at that time included the Deputy Building Commissioner for the City of Chicago, who discussed their building code scofflaw list, 
the public advocate for New York City, who reviewed their worst landlord watch list, and a Toronto City Councillor who, who introduced their city's Sa Rent Safe Toronto program. I also want to acknowledge the leadership of our colleague Councillor Lara as the Chair of the Housing Committee in raising the issue of housing code enforcement and the need for more proactive rental inspections at, in, at last week's hearing, particularly as it relates to higher uh, rates of asthma in black and brown communities. All tenants have the right to a decent, safe and sanitary housing conditions. And it is not only our responsibility as a city to ensure property owners regularly demonstrate compliance, but to take to task those who openly and willingly flout regulations simply because their business model may view fines as the cost of doing business in our city. In order to strengthen public confidence in our code enforcement activities, the city must call attention to a scofflaw property owner's record and compel compliance. This ordinance would add weight to our enforcement of the sanitary code, state sanitary code, the building code and fire code by publishing an annual list of scofflaw property owners who are involved with active code enforcement proceedings in the housing court, have racked up six or more code violations in a year and have their properties designated as problem properties under the existing city programme. A minor amendment to this rental registration ordinance would also require disclosure of property ownership interest. Owners on the list would be banned from doing business with the city, such as being awarded a contract, receiving a grant, or having an application for zoning relief approved. They would still be eligible for assistance to rehab a rental unit to fix outstanding violations, and the exemptions from the rental inspection ordinance would also apply. I look forward to bringing the city, uh, bringing the city to lead by example uh, in our code enforcement and accountability of scofflaw property owners. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Eugene. Council Eugene, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, Councillor Braden for her leadership on this issue. Um, negligent landlords and owners who refuse to clean up their properties have been getting nothing more than a slap on the wrist for too long. My office has been working a lot on dumpster issues and throughout our neighborhoods and they're really hard to work on because landlords do not feel the pressure from the city to have to uh, do, to, to really have to maintain the dumpsters and are not afraid of the fines that, um, that they're given. Housing codes, building codes, sanitation codes were all created to keep residents healthy and safe. If you violate one of those codes, you might get a ticket. Similar to when a, someone's driving, if a driver is going too fast, that driver gets a ticket. However, that driver keeps on getting those speeding tickets, specifically three within three months, the RMV will take away that license. Those individuals who routinely and habitually receive code violations for their properties might need to have their license or ability to do business with the city taken away at least until they fix the problems. We know that most property owners are good owners and do the right thing. It's a small percentage of bad property owners who have an outsized negative impact on our neighborhoods. Every neighborhood from Mattapan to Beacon Hill, High Park to Back Bay, deserves strong compliance and enforcement of these codes because it is critically important that all residents, especially in our black and brown neighborhoods that have often been ignored, it's important that they have a safe, sanitary and healthy place to live. So I look forward to working with my council colleagues in pushing this ordinance forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. The chair recognizes Councilor Bork. Councilor Bork, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilor um, Braden and Lou Jen, my co-sponsors on this. Um, I'm very excited for us to be moving the next step toward uh, an ordinance because, as Councilor Braden mentioned, we have been talking about this since 2021 and before. Um, and really, you know, I think the key thing here is that what we learned whenever we've talked to ISD is like, yes, enforcement is critical and we need to increase resources for enforcement and evenness of enforcement, et cetera. But the reality is that for the people who, as Councillor Louis Jen said, are allowing their properties to be blights on our neighborhood, of negatively affecting all the good property owners, we need to put the lever of reputational risk into the mix as well. 
because it's just not acceptable what folks are doing. And the reality is that people on the ground know who these bad actors are. Um, and we all know, I think, in our offices who these bad actors are. Um, but it needs to be something that um, is part of the public conversation and is something that uh, folks are seeing when they're thinking about where to um, rent and, and who to do business with. And the reality is that we have lots of um, public safety and hygiene standards when we talk about you know, restaurants and a whole host of other things. And, and your rent is the biggest expense for almost every Bostonian. And so the idea that there's an important government role in making sure that there are minimum quality standards for that thing that you're spending we hope only a third, but maybe 50%, maybe more than half your income every month on, um, is a key role for government. And, uh, and the thing is that the reality right now, and we've talked about this in other contexts here in this chamber recently, is that because vacancy rates are so low, it shifts all the power into the hands of these bad actors because they know that people can't, there can't be a flight to quality, which is the other way that you solve bad quality properties, right, would be people just being able to vote with their feet and go somewhere else, except that there's no vacancies in the city of Boston. So in that context, it's really important for us to be saying as a city, hey, there are minimum standards, and when you violate them, you don't just continue to build up an endless pile of unpaid tickets, and then as Council Braden said, at some point pay them, it's something we're gonna hold you accountable for. And, and I'll say that in my, um, in my district, we see this in particular with some of the large landlords who, root to, who rent to our students in places like Fenway and Mission Hill. Um, you know, recently we had a, a citizen version of this in Mission Hill where somebody came with a new project that they wanted to do and they went to meet with the Civic Association and the first thing the Civic Association said was, hey, what about these $40,000 of tickets from the existing properties that you own right now, right? And you know what? Those folks went and paid those tickets and cleaned it up because they wanted to be able to develop the next property. I think that's the kind of conversation that we have to be able to have and that's what I mean when I say, you know, Folks who are bad actors shouldn't be able to get away with it. Um, there should be a real reputational risk. And other places, um, as are referenced in the ordinance, you know, both Chicago but also actually Toronto came in in 2021, and they have a really great rating system, and it really is helping to inform renters. Um, and it's something that, you know, once once you measure landlords on reaching these um, standards, people want to make sure that they measure up, and that's what we've got to be aiming to do. So thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Coletta, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Lara, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, Council Rall, please add the chair. Docket 0625 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0626? Docket number 0626, Councilor Braden offer the following. An ordinance amending City of Boston Code, Ordinance Section 16-1.9G to prohibit the sale of guinea pigs in pet shops. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before I uh, make my remarks, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the MSPCA and the Animal Rescue League uh, for their advocacy and welcome Cara Holmquist and Alison Blanc um, here this afternoon. Um, they have been working with our office to bring this, uh, this issue to light and uh, helping us with this, um, bringing it to light and, and working on us to develop this ordinance uh, amendment. Today, at the request of the MSPC, MSPCA, I am pleased to introduce an amendment to an existing ordinance related to the sale of animals, which are, was sponsored by a Councillor Matt O'Malley and passed unanimously seven years ago in March of 2016. The ordinance prohibited the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits from pet, stop, pet shops in the city. Docket 0626 would add guinea pigs. I think it is important to note that Boston was the first municipality to pass a pet shop ban in Massachusetts. Since then, 11 other cities and towns have followed our lead, and several more local ordinances and bylaws have been taken up, will be taken up this spring. The MSPCA recently brought, brought to our attention that shelters, rescue organizations, and animal control agencies are seeing an uptick in the number of guinea pigs being surrendered being surrendered or found as strays. The MSPCA, for example, has seen a sharp increase in the number of guinea pigs surrendered in their adoption centre in JP 
at a 37% increase since the pandemic began. Guinea pigs remain in their, sh in their shelters nearly twice as long as cats and dogs, and the average length of stay at the MSPCA for a guinea pig in 2022 was 29 days, compared to just 13 days for cats. As a result, cages at the MSPCA and other local shelters are consistently full, making it challenging, challenging to readily accept additional guinea pigs throughout the year. The MSPCA informed our office that over 60% of the guinea pigs surrendered were originally purchased in pet shops. 311 case data published by the city, city's analysed Boston hub also demonstrate growing cases of stray guinea pigs compared to before to the, the level before 2020, with reports coming in from all across the city, including Alston, Fenway, Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan and Mission Hill. My office reached out to the Boston Animal Control, Care and Control, and their team shared intake statistics, confirming significant increases year over year since 2020. In the tw fall of 2022, the New York City Council also considered a proposed ban on guinea pig sales in pet shops, with media outlets referring to a pandemic-era guinea pig crisis. New York was unable to take action before the end of the year, and I'm confident that Boston will again lead the way on this issue. Lastly, I think the timing is appropriate as March is Adopt a Rescued Guinea Pig Month, and I look forward to reviewing this ordinance so we can, call, uh, can all learn more about this growing issue and do our part to improve the animal welfare by addressing the rise in surrendered guinea pigs purchased from get pet shops. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Braden. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Coletta, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Lara, Council Eugen, Council Mejia, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Please add Council Worrell. Please add Council Bach. Docket 0626 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 0627, please? Docket number 0627, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. An ordinance to make the Boston City Council's webpage on the Boston City website more resourceful and accessible. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I filed this um, ordinance in order to uh, be able to make our web, web pages on the city website more accessible and also encourage uh, civic engagement as well as updating our constituents of our, how we're filing, what we're filing, how we're filing, and of course how we're voting. Um, just, uh, I did have a meeting with um, one of the members from our DOA department and discussed um, several tools that are already in place. Um, did you guys know that there are actually tools that you can add drop-down menus to the webs to the current web page, um, as well as you know multiple uh, ver a variety of um, uh, features that you can add to your web page. So I I and also we have eVote, which we're not taking advantage of. So it would record our votes here um, and also give sort of visualization data um, on the website as to recording exactly um, how progressive are we really in the city of Boston um, City Council. So um, I'm proposing, of course, a list of different uh, suggestions. Uh, of course, looking forward to um, the chair uh, to hold a hearing, have a conversation, and discuss what would be reasonable to be able to um, record. Obviously, this may take um, possible um, adding an FTE uh, in order to upkeep this um, to, for, for, for maintenance, that is. Um, and I think that that's also a conversation that we should be open to. Um, so just to list a few, um, the, our webpage should list city councilors um, their Boston email address, of course, whatever's there already, your name, your general biography, maybe shortened so it doesn't take up the whole page and you can drop down. Um, also, your staff and their role and the feature to be able to click on your staff's email in order to access services for your office. 
as well as uh, city councilors' filings, uh, council organized by filing type, um, vote our votes, I, as I mentioned already, our committees, but also the schedule um, for hearings or working sessions or public testimony ahead of time. Since we have them, we should post them, um, as well as any projects, any types of um, related uh, council work that we believe that our constituents should be purview to, should have purview to. So I um, look forward to this conversation and I hope that my council colleagues will agree that transparency is best, um, the best way to perform this um, political work and look forward to the hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak in this matter? The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to thank my colleague for bringing this um, to the chamber, and I just want to uplift that. Please add my name, and as we continue to talk about accessibility here in the city of Boston and websites and all things that deal with making sure that we are being accountable to folks, I just want to uplift that, you know, and I want to reiterate um, that not everybody knows how to read and write, even in their native language, and as we continue to do this work, let's check our own privilege and making sure that we're really thinking about uh, folks who, who may need audio and visual as a way to, to be able to have accessibility to city government uh, services and issues like that. So I just wanted to uplift that and uh, advocate that as we continue to have this conversation, accessibility is key and we have to make sure that we keep in mind those folks who may not know how to read, write, um, even in their own native language. So I really do applaud Councillor Anderson for her relentless uh, uh, efforts to making sure that we are uh, meeting this moment and I look forward to the conversation and to supporting you in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clara, please add Council Royal, Council Bach, Council Coletta, Council Lara, Council Eugene, Council Mejia, Council Orell. Docket 0627 will be referred to the committee. Okay, Council Braden. Docket 0627 will be referred to the committee on rules and administration. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0628. Docket number 0628, Council Worrell offered the following. Order for a hearing to explore workforce development via scholarships for Boston Public School students to increase access to all forms of higher education. The Chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. And I'd like to suspend the rules and now Councilor uh, Mejia as an original co-sponsor. Councilor Mejia is added. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Um, one of my priorities is to have our students and families on a path aimed towards success with support from cradle to career. Uh, simply put, access to highly high quality education is one of the best investments we can make. Helping to support better incomes and health, stronger families and communities, and a safer, more competitive city. Right now, educational access and completion is directly linked to race and skin color. Um, among students enrolled in four-year public institution, only 45.9% of black students complete their degree um, in six years, the lowest rate compared to other races and ethnicities. Black men in particular have the lowest rate of completion, at 40%. This high dropout rate is partially due to the fact that 65% of African-American college students are independent, balancing pursuing their degree with full-time work and family responsibilities. High costs and low funds don't just delay educational progress and reduce graduation rates. They lead to real harm to long-term health and well-being. According to the Greater Boston Food Bank, half of our black, brown, LGBTQ students are food insecure compared to an already far too high average of 37% of all students. Uh, these are not just the statistics. They are limitations at best and outright walls at worst. What made my college a reality for me was a tuition-based scholarship from Balfour Academy. Other students in similar situations have to string together funds from a mix of scholarship, jobs, and loans. All too often, these pressures become too much. Faced with tuition, tuition fees, complex work schedules, food and housing insecurity, many students drop out. A full 40% of people with student loans do not have the degree that would justify the investment. Most of these people are black, black brown, and low income. These students try to do the right things, 
were not adequately supported or are left significantly in a worse position. Other cities, states, and countries are recognizing the value of a complete education for all residents. Until our state and federal government provide, provide the resources necessary to provide universal access to advanced education, Boston must work to ensure that our most vulnerable students have the opportunity to choose their paths, whether that is an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or career in the crafts and trades. I look forward to working with the city, corporate partners, philanthropies, and academic ins institutions to build a program just to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank uh, Councilor Worrell for his leadership in this space um, and adding me as a co-sponsor. I was really excited to see this uh, filed as a first-generation uh, college student um, and the first person in my family to graduate high school. I wasn't even thinking about going to college. It just felt like it was not something that I was going to be able to do. In fact, I worked three jobs. I was an RA, I did work study, and I worked in retail all throughout college. And that's a sacrifice that I made because I believed that at that moment in time that the best way for me to disrupt my cycle of poverty was through education. And so there are a lot of young people right now who are deciding whether or not they're going to be able to continue their studies or drop out. And I think that as a city, because we are so rich in resources, we have an opportunity and a responsibility with all of these higher ed institutions who are li literally um, profiting off of the backs of the kids who live here, I think we have an opportunity to lean into that conversation in terms of accountability. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. And then the last piece that I'd like to highlight is that our office, um, through tapping into our own personal network, have had to work with so many students who were short a few thousand dollars here and there to be able to re-register for the second semester. So I think that this is something that we as a city not only have an opportunity, but we also have a responsibility. And as the chair of workforce development, really looking to have this conversation that looks at side, not just in terms of education, but also how do we hold our um, business partners uh, and how do we not uh, so much call them out, but how do we invite them to participate in ways that are going to help us to finally address the wealth gap that we all have been talking about here in the city of Boston. So thank you, Council Rorell, and thank you, President Flynn, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank Councillor uh, Worrell and Mejia for filing this, and um, I'm especially excited about it. I have a lot of um, the universities, uh, the major universities in the city in my district, um, and you know, I, I have often said that one of the things that gives me the most encouragement is when we actually see our Boston BPS graduate kids going to these universities and getting scholarships. And, um, and you know, a, a number of times I've been at events in particular, there's a set of scholarships, the Menino and the Community Service Scholarships at BU that are serving hundreds of our um, Boston uh, public school graduates, and, and that's really exciting. But I've also had lots of conversations with our universities about scholarships that exist on paper, but our students are not actually getting them. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's great if we, in theory, have an opportunity, but what we really want is to make sure that our BPS students, like Councilor Royal is saying, you know, if they, if they clear a certain bar, that they are going to actually get these opportunities and that they're not something that's kind of staying on paper. So, um, to me, this is one of the most substantial ways in which the universities and the city can work together for the future of our young people. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, one thing and, and an important piece for us to kind of pursue this conversation with each of our institutional partners, and it's something that happens in the pilot conversations, and it's something that happens in the institutional master plan conversations, um, but it really makes sense for us to have a kind of overall citywide strategy on this, um, and it's certainly one of the areas where, uh, you know, it remains disappointing and shameful in some sense that Boston is literally recognized globally as a higher education hub for the world, and we can't match enough of our students with these opportunities. So really excited um, to see this be filed. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bob. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Bob, Councilor Braden, Councilor Carter, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jen, Councilor Murphy, Please add the chair. Originally, um, this was going to be referred to the committee 
on education, but after listening to uh, Councilor Mejia, we're going to place it in the Labor, Workforce, and Economic Development Committee, uh, per your request. Mr. Clerk, can we please read docket 0629? Docket number 0629, Councilor Worrell offered the following. Order for a hearing regarding providing technical assistance to civic associations. The Chair recognizes um, Councilor Worrell. Councilor Worrell, you uh, have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I'd like to suspend the rules and add uh, Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor Coletta as um, original co-sponsors. Hearing no objection, Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor Coletta are added that she recognizes Council Earl. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. And we rely upon our civic associations to uh, organize our neighborhoods, drive outreach and engagement, and sh help shape our city's future. Uh, these organ organizations are often all volunteer, nonprofits, uh, working with thin budgets and limited techno technical resources. And we know that they work 24 7 around the clock. Uh, the many things that we have come to rely upon our civic associations for require costly support services, web design, translation services, and logistics that are either out of reach or inhibit spending on other activities. Our office was able to hire Christina Glover, um, a local graphic designer, who provided these exact supports to our civic associations. Uh, she built our civics websites, assisted in graphic design work, helped develop social media and outreach strategies, and trained our, mem our, trained our civic members to use and maintain these systems independently. Uh, this small move helps civics operate more effectively. Um, and done at scale, we believe uh, this could help our civic to meaningfully access and engage uh, with more of our community members in our city. Uh, the city benefits from the existence of our city uh, civic associations, and we will benefit by strengthening them. I look forward uh, to working with the city to identify what ways we can do to scale this, um, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Council Arrell uh, for leading on this issue. Um, this is an issue that uh, a lot of my office and my staff, when we're in interaction with, with civic associations, we realize um, how much more work and how much more integrated in our communities it could be if they had more technical assistance and were more keyed into the things happening here. Um, they're often the lifeblood of community engagement for residents. Um, where they're able to voice concerns. Uh, they're volunteer organizations run by people who are passionate about their neighborhoods, but it takes really hard work to run them, and they deserve and need our support. Uh, we do technical assistance for businesses. We do technical assistance for, um, for housing. The thing that often connects our businesses, our houses, our seniors, is often civic association. So it's about time that we think critically about what services and assistance we as a city can provide uh, to these important communities. And so especially as we move, continue to exist in this hybrid hearing era, technical assistance will become more and more essential for our businesses, for our, for our civic associations, as we become more and more reliant on technology. We can help each other and give our civic organizations help with uh, what they need. And so I'm excited to work with my council colleagues um, on, on this and seeing how we as a city can show up for our civic associations, which will also help to further democratize um, civic associations and make them more open to younger generations and people who traditionally aren't, you know, uh, present for civic association meetings. So thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I'm, I'm proud and delighted to be added as a co-sponsor uh, from the lead sponsor, um, my esteemed colleague from District 4, as well as uh, Council Lujan. Um, throughout my time as, well, first even before I was an aide, um, I was a young girl going to a lot of these civic association, uh, civic association meetings with my mother and have fond memories of understanding exactly what grassroots was and, and community was by attending a lot of these, these meetings. Um, and then since 2015, uh, I've been an aide for state rep and, and then um, my predecessor um, and have sat shoulder to shoulder with my neighbors uh, for hundreds of, of these meetings. And so I have deep admiration and respect for the work that they do. Um, it really is a part-time job with the added emphasis from Office of Neighborhood Services for formalized process for development review through the, the ZBA and NISD and even BPDA processes. So a lot of our folks have turned volunteers 
um, to part-time uh, community activists and leaders, which they do happily, and as you pointed out, they're passionate to do it, um, but they're, they've also become zoning attorneys and tech experts and, and um, have tried to get uh, language access equipment, which is so difficult to uh, secure despite the expansion um, through the city of Boston. So I do look forward to uh, this conversation. I know that some neighborhood groups in my district have been calling for this, and I really see it as a way to expand participation, expand democracy, especially as it relates to translation services, where a large part of, of the folks who do attend our civic association meetings come from um, one specific socioeconomic class or is a homogenous class, um, usually homeowners. So I really see this as a way to, um, to e expand uh, uh, access at the end of the day. And I want to thank you again for putting this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Quetta. The chair, recognize, the chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you to Councilor Morrell. I just want to uplift Councilor um, Then Campbell was so incredibly adamant about supporting civic associations, and so uh, I really want to just bring her name into this chamber because I remember when I was her constituent, um, in 2016, 2017, around my neighborhood, there was an illegal uh, boarding house with 13 um, level three sex offenders. And as a result of that work, myself and one of my neighbors decided to uh, create a civic association and we didn't know what we were getting into. All we knew is that we wanted to stop this from happening um, and we learned a lot about this work, and you are absolutely right. It is work that we do because it is our responsibility to take care of ourselves when we think that government is supposed to do that for us, and civic association leaders are the ones who are stepping up to the plate, organizing, printing out materials, door knocking, trying to get people activated, and oftentimes they go unseen and unheard. So I really do appreciate your leadership in making sure that we're setting up our civic associations up for success. I also want to say, when you snooze, you lose, because I would hit you up um, to put me on this as one of your original co-sponsors, because we, um, since uh, a few years ago, we have been working with mutual aid groups to help build their capacity. And in fact, some of the work that we've been doing right now with our mutual aid groups is around training and development and even providing them with ways for them to be able to have access to um, funding so that they can continue to do their work. So I would look forward to partnering with you all to help you uh, make this happen because I'm deeply committed to, to this work. And then the other piece is that we've been working with uh, civic associations, just the heads of these organizations uh, to help support them. So I'm going to let them know that if we're, you have been doing this in District 4, and I, have, I mentioned this to them in one of our meetings, but I would love to see this as a citywide effort um, because we have such an amazing opportunity uh, to lean in. I think it's incredibly, um, I don't know what the right word is. I just think it's, um, I think when I hear from civic associations that they're coming out of their own pocket to print when we have a city printer downstairs, I think that we already have access to so many tools, and all we need to do is open up the shop so that we can make it easier for these civic associations to actually do their work. And I also know that my colleague, Councillor Anderson, way before she even came on here, was uh, working in deep community. So I am sure that uh, as the ways, the chairs, the ways and means, that you're going to bring a lot of resources to make this happen for the Civic Association. So thank you for your and leadership in advance. I'm just putting you on the spot on that one. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yeah, no pressure at all. Um, I wanted to thank uh, my council colleague, uh, Council Worrell. This is a brilliant idea. Of course, I was like, why didn't you put me on it? Same as Councilor <laughs> here. Um, but I really, I want to offer um, our model in District 7, of course, um, to um, allude to Council Mejia's point about consolidating community and working with the leaders. Um, that some sort of round table or, or some sort of council or coalition of all these civic associations would um, really uh, consolidate the efforts as well as you know we understand we we the counselors have a lot on our schedules as is but to be able to meet um, all of the chairs or all of the leaders in one platform 
um, maybe on a monthly basis, would really streamline pr processes. So adding this component of technical assistance is crucial because we're talking about civic associations that, again, are inundated with a lot of community efforts, but then they go into campaigning on issues that they care about. They may need um, to uh, my sister Lara, who's given me a lot of input in terms of grassroots organizing and teaching um, civic associations that need it how to properly organize and execute or implementing implement um, services or uh, their programs that they may be working on. So um, I would say one that model. I'm looking forward to the conversation and looking at how we can um, bring that as a as a solution or possible solution, but also in terms of um, technical assistance, um, if we're looking into uh, budgets to supporting, what I've done in District 7 is actually uh, consolidate or partner universities resources and fellows or uh, interns with different, depending on, of course, the interest um, or uh, the goal, with different classrooms from different universities and to, in order to be able to um, execute some of this uh, work. So we have a data visualization, we have one on website, we have one for uh, developing the District 7 app so that all District 7 uh, constituents will become members on one app, right? Building more transparency, of course, creating more access, but also consolidating the entire district's calendar in collaboration with the city makes a lot of sense. I can coordinate that I know that there's a development happening, say, on Humboldt Ave, and I know to avoid that to go a different direction. Or at least I know what's happening with National Grid on this street, or something like that. But also, there should be a connection between 311 and this app as well, so that there's clear transparency and follow through in terms of constituent service. So I'm very interested in looking at data and as, as you are. I know that our minds um, work a lot alike, um, Councilor Rowe, and um, how I can offer any of my thoughts or um, work. Thank you. Thank you, Council fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Bork, Council Braden, Council Carter, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Lara, Council Mejia, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. This docket 0629 will be referred to the Committee on City Services, Innovation, Te <coughs> Innovation Technology. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0630. Docket number 0630, Council Arroyo, off of the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the ban of miniature alcohol bottles, also known as NIPS, in the city of Boston. Thank you. <clears throat> and per the request of the council president, we will use the term miniature alcohol bottles. <laughs> the chair recognizes Council of Royal. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Or singles. Uh, well, there's some uh, historical issues with the word NIPS. Uh, so uh, everyone has seen uh, on a day-to-day basis, if you're walking around your neighborhood, if you're driving into work, I saw it today on my drive into work, the miniatures or the singles strewn on the roadway, uh, strewn on the side of the road. I didn't realize uh, immediately just how major of an issue that was. I took office in 2020. And about a year after that, a neighborhood group, uh, Keep High Park Beautiful, a group that I have volunteered with and my staff has volunteered with, which is largely made up of uh, about 12 people, give or take, at any given time, uh, who volunteer their time to clean up our neighborhoods. Uh, and the GLOBE covered it because it was so significant. And what ended up coming out of it was uh, Gardner, Massachusetts, there was a liquor store that offered five cents back for every bottle that was brought to them. And so in Gardner, Massachusetts, uh, in two years, they collected 100,000 miniatures or singles off the streets of Gardner. Uh, and so inspired by that, Keep High Park Beautiful did a similar request of a local uh, liquor store. And they were offered uh, $500 by that liquor store and another 500 by an anonymous donor if they could get to 10,000 singles or miniatures. They thought that would take them a year. They're only a group of about 12 people. It took them two months. And so 
12 people, Hyde Park, two months, 10,000 of these just off of the street. And so that was my first sort of on my radar that this is an issue I might want to look at. Uh, when, I was, when I was running for office, I had conversations with Chelsea. Uh, and Chelsea, uh, specifically uh, Chelsea City Council President Roy Avedaneda, uh, who had moved for this in 2018. And what he had told me was they had had a hearing at the Chelsea City Council about opiate addiction because opiate addiction is a very serious issue uh, and overdoses at that time, they wanted to get a sense of how many people were overdosing and at that time it was brought to his attention that they actually had received about four times the amount of calls for alcohol related emergencies, uh, almost a thousand of those. And so Chelsea moved forward in 2018 with a citywide ban of the miniatures or the singles and in a year's time that number had dropped by more than half. Uh, and so you get two sort of prongs to this issue. There's an environmental issue. I'll dive a little bit more into that. There's a medical sort of related issue. I'll dive a little bit more into that. Uh, but in Chelsea, which did this in 2018, uh, they were recently asked about this because I presented this. And the police chief there, Chief How uh, Houghton, uh, called it a game changer. Said that the impact in Chelsea was noticeable, significant, and that medical emergencies had dropped by almost half in that time, never mind just the beautification of Chelsea and, and the neighborhoods in the streets because they don't have these littered everywhere in the same way. Uh, in Boston, this is an issue that has come up before. I actually had my staff look it up. So we have a 2015 licensing board decision for Roxbury. In 2015, they had determined that a transfer of a license, there was a liquor store in Roxbury that had a poor reputation. They sold the license to someone else. When that person was coming in for the transfer of license, the commission responsibly, and I think uh, doing their job, listening to constituents, imposed a singles or miniatures ban. That was in 2015. This was a new owner, hadn't owned the property, and so they challenged that decision and said, look, this wasn't us. Uh, this was the owner before us. That challenge uh, was denied. They essentially, they came back that the city has the power to change and, and exclude the purchase and sale of miniatures and singles. And in fact, we looked that up through Analyze Boston and we got back these numbers. Analyze Boston is not a perfect system and so this is more of a floor than a ceiling. There's likely more places that have had these banned or, or told that they could not sell these than Analyze Boston has caught. But we have at least 70 businesses in the city of Boston that are not allowed to sell singles or miniatures. Uh, Alston has three. Back Bay has three, Chinatown has four, Downtown has seven, Fenway has seven, High Park has one, the North End has one, the Seaport has five, Brighton has two, Charlestown has two, Dorchester has six, East Boston has seven, Jamaica Plain has two, Mattapan has just one, Mission Hill has just one, Rosendale has four, Roxbury has ten, and South Boston has three. So those are over 70 businesses that can't sell singles or miniatures today already. They just can't do it. And the reasoning for that, which was illuminated in this 2015 decision, is because the harms of singles and miniatures are well known. They end up on the streets. They are often, uh, in passing this, it has been, I have been open and public about issues in my own family with addiction. Uh, and so I was aware of this from an anecdotal standpoint, but I've received phone calls from others since I came forward that in their experience as recovering alcoholics, miniatures are a problem because they are used by people who are struggling with alcohol addiction as a way to moderate their drinking, but they often consume more of the miniatures or singles because it, it's sort of an illusion of you're drinking less, but you're actually drinking more because they, they pile up. And so part of that medical emergency number, we had some folks who said, you know, if you ban singles or miniatures, people would just purchase larger containers of alcohol. But the emergency numbers from Chelsea don't bear that out. If individuals were actually buying larger containers of alcohol and consuming those bottles of alcohol at the same level or more, you would have seen more emergency calls. You would have seen more medical uh, emergencies, and we haven't seen that. Newton did this last year. Uh, one of their city councilors was asked about it, and they remarked that they have noticed a significant and noticeable change there. What neither of these cities have noticed is any of their liquor stores going out of business. And so the only argument that has been made to me 
about why we need to uh, not do this is that it would harm liquor store profit margins uh, and that it might drive them out of business. However, in Chelsea and Newton and the other instances and places where this has happened, that has not actually occurred. We have here in the city of Boston 70 at least liquor stores that can't sell miniatures and singles as we speak. And so this is not a situation that I took lightly. I think banning things is sort of a, a last resort issue. However, miniature bottles, back to that environmental prong, they're not part of the bottle bill. You don't get any change back when you return them. And even if they were part of the bottle bill, which there's a bill that has stalled out, I think there's two bills that have stalled out at the State House on adding them to the bottle bill. Even if they were part of the bottle bill, the bottles are so small that they actually don't function in the recycling machines. They would actually break and clog those machines up. So even if you added a five cent return, the machines we currently have in this state could not handle them. Uh, and so this is an instance where, for the public good, I think we should be uh, banning these universally, just all across the city, level the playing field. There's 70 plus uh, licenses out there right now that already have this restriction. We should level it out. Everyone should have that restriction. The board has the ability to do that restriction immediately. Uh, the way that would work is liquor licenses get renewed annually. And so as people come forward for the renewal, they would have this restriction added to them. And all new, all new liquor licenses for retail store, package store sales would have to go through this process and would have this already as part of that. Um, there has been sort of overwhelming support to my office on this from both environmental uh, concerns across the state. Uh, it was brought to my attention that in, in Rhode Island they've actually tried to move forward with a ban. In Maine, under Governor LePage, there was an attempt to move forward with a ban. Instead, they added it to the bottle bill. This is not a new idea. It has been done in other places. I think we would be one of the more significant cities in New England to do it. However, Chicago, uh, which is actually about three times the size of Boston, has also already done this. So this is not a new concept, it's not a new idea, it's not going to close your local liquor store or your mom and pop package store. It is simply going to protect residents from an overabundance of litter that they see every day when they go about their streets. These are strewn around playgrounds, they're strewn around parks, and most concerningly, they're strewn across roadways, which would suggest that they are actually consumed while driving. And so these are the kinds of instances uh, that I think we can prevent with a simple act here in the council. We don't have the power in the council to do this. It would have to be through the licensing board and the administration. So this is a request for a hearing to make clear to the administration that I personally believe, and hopefully the, my council colleagues agree, that this is something we should do moving forward, that we would like to see this implemented in the city as a whole, and we would like to follow the lead of other communities in the city and, and, and country uh, and state, or rather, follow the lead of other states uh, and other cities within this state that have made this in the health and, and well-being of their residents and their communities a priority. And so this is why I'm moving forward with this. It's my hope that uh, my colleagues sign on and, and show avid support. I know that all of us as counselors have heard about this. I know as a district counselor, I knew about that 2015 decision because I'd had neighborhood associations and civic organizations, whenever a new license comes up in my district, petition my office to ask for this, this type of singles or uh, uh, miniature bottle ban. So, now we are doing it for the citywide so that it's universal, so that everybody has it, and so that our neighborhoods can thrive and be clean and healthy places to live. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council of Royal. We need um, a motion to substitute the language. Uh, motion to substitute the language simply changing uh, the word names for miniature alcohol bottles and sinks. It's been second. All those in favor? Aye. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to rise to say that um, in my district, and particularly uh, in Back Bay and the Fenway, um, this has become, and actually also in Beacon Hill, this has become a kind of standard thing that um, residents have asked of new liquor stores moving in and so Councillor Arroyo mentioned um, a number of the establishments uh, in my district that already have this restriction on them um, and I would say it sounds like an undercount just based on the number that I know of 
Um, so, you know, it seems to me, and, and honestly, that's come out of long community conversation about, about exactly the impacts that Council Arroyo referenced. So it does seem to me that um, this is already sort of happening in practice in conversation between our residents and the liquor stores, but only the new ones. And so it is creating a kind of like uneven playing field. And I think, you know, given, I, I think that given the community um, consensus about a lot of the downsides of providing these, that it makes more sense to have a consistent rule across the board. So just wanted to say, please add my name. And it definitely um, makes sense to me based on the conversations we're having uh, in my district. Thank you, Council Buck. Would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Lara, Councilor Luijen, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Rell, please add the chair. Docket 0630 be referred to the Committee on Small Business Professional Licensure. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0631. <coughs> Docket number 0631, Councilor. Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Resolution to extend best wishes to Muslims in Boston, Massachusetts, the United States, and worldwide for a joyous and meaningful observance of Ramadan, a holy month of prayer, fasting, charity, and reflection. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, I today um, hope, well, this evening, uh, we project that uh, it may be the commencement of Ramadan, um, and tomorrow being the first day that we begin our fasting uh, journey for the month of Ramadan. Um, I'd like to ask my council colleagues um, to extend best wishes to Muslims in Boston, um, Massachusetts, and the United States and worldwide for um, a joyous, meaningful observance of Ramadan and um, a holy month of prayer, fasting, and charity. Um, Islam is one of the world's major uh, religions and part of our share uh, faith traditions. Ramadan is the holy month of fasting and spiritual renewal for Muslims worldwide um, and the ninth month of Muslim ca calendar year. Um, one of our purposes for fasting during the holy month of Ramadan is for Muslims to gain better understanding of the, fl of the plight faced by people living with poverty. And Ramadan is a time uh, to reflect spiritually, build um, communally, and aid those who are struggling uh, financially, a reason to celebrate and express gratitude in the month. Um, just to keep it simple, um, there is a lot of research that proves that um, fasting, um, specifically uh, fast, dry fasting, uh, it has pr proven over, um, well, if you do it over, I think, 45 days to 90 days, you, uh, your cells begin to regenerate, therefore repairing uh, illnesses um, in the body. So we feel that when you are fasting, um, so I will probably not be saying uh, breaking the quorums or <laughs> saying any bad words, um, restraining from food and water or any type of pleasurable activities. Um, it's a time for me to basically uh, regenerate and re-innovate um, my spirit, mind, body, and soul. But again, remembering those that go without. So in Ramadan, um, the way we practice is by giving to charity. Um, and there is a period of time, so if you are sick or if you are uh, pregnant or um, breastfeeding, of course you are exempt. Or to, if you're much um, older in age and you need uh, nourishment, of course, you're also exempt. Um, so I ask those of you to um, join me. Um, and there are um, over 131,000 Muslims in Boston. Uh, at least that's what um, the numbers say. But um, in District 7 alone, there are a lot of um, opportunities for us to learn about Islamic traditions and support our Muslims, brothers and sisters. Traditionally, Muslims, um, we try to practice, not that we are claiming or uh, pretentiously saying that we are humble, but the practice is to attempt to uh, build up humility and self. Um, so you will find that a lot of Muslims um, are just getting uh, accustomed to uh, advocating or claiming um, a position in 
uh, civic government. So I ask all my council colleagues, you ask for our Muslim vote, you ask for our Muslim support, you knock on our doors, you come to our events, you come to our Eid. When we say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, you respond um, out of respect. So today I ask you to continue to remember us. Do not neglect the Muslim community. Stand up for us as you stand for the other communities, even if we're not loud enough. And I uh, wish us a happy Ramadan. And who wants to join um, fasting? No, no one? Okay, well, <laughs> I thought um, my uh, one or two colleagues would may join. So um, thank you, and uh, a very uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm asking for a suspension and pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak in this matter? The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I'm just happy to stand in support of it. My uh, best friend, my, my longest best friend, is a practicing Muslim. And for the last year, I've had the pleasure of, of getting to know Councillor Fernandez Anderson. And so during Ramadan, I typically like to join in on the fasting in solidarity, which is, I think, what <laughs> my colleague was um, re referencing. And so I'm excited to really join and stand in solidarity with our Muslim siblings during this holy month of fasting and prayer. And Councillor Fernandez Anderson is going to help me figure out what my prayer should be this month. So I'll be joining in on the fasting. Thank, thank you, Councillor Lara. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Royal, Councillor Bok, Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louisiane, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Royal, please add the chair. Councilor Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules in adoption of docket 0631. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 03. I'm sorry. Please read docket 0632, please. Docket number 0632. Councilor Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Resolution to improve quality of life by way of activating space, creating green open spaces, and place making and keeping for youth and families in District 7. Thank you. The Chair recognizes <coughs> Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I feel like when I stand up, I should really say thank you, Mr. Clerk, but we'll do that too next time. Um, I am really excited about um, this one. Not as excited as I will be about the next one, but I'm really excited about um, reading this one. Um, so we all know the data. We know that uh, District 7 is historically the most disenfranchised district, Roxbury being the most disenfranchised neighborhood, with now um, Council of Rao's <coughs> district being the most disenfranchised. Um, yeah, um, and so <laughs> I wanted to, we have done a lot of work around this, and by we, I mean the civic associations. Um, shout out to, uh, I'm not gonna start naming one because then I'll forget the other, but shout out to all of the civic associations and neighborhood groups um, and advocacy and nonprofit organizations, Northeastern University, uh, Boston University, Harvard University, um, MIT, of course, who all have supported, sorry, UMass Boston um, and Roxbury Community College who have supported in this endeavor. Shout out to all the artists, uh, the District 7 Artist Coalition, also the District 7 Place Keepers um, Co-op. Uh, co uh, co we have basically uh, figured out a way to come together and work on an anti-displacement project, master project in Roxbury. Essentially, we would like to work with the administration, and we have been. Um, thank you so much to Chief Dillon, um, and of course, um, Arthur Jemerson from, for, from BPDA, who have been open and collaborative in this effort to creating open spaces, and as well as 
uh, developing or uh, temporarily developing or activating or placemaking in empty parcels in Roxbury. We look forward to sh uh, showing you some of these ideas. We have um, gone as far as created um, with architect students, created all our designs based on surveys. We've surveyed Roxbury, we've surveyed our artists, we've talked to um, again, advocates and planners and organizers, and we've come up with designs and renderings for these parcels. And we can't wait to meet with the mayor to be able to show what we're proposing. Um, it's all moving ahead and it's happening. Um, hopefully we will have more um, diverse, more robust uh, uh, District 7. And by activating these parcels, of course, we are beautifying Roxbury. We are adding or building a uh, quality of life in Roxbury so that our children can step outside and have a place, a safe place to, to play more other than parks. Yes, um, <laughs> I am an advocate of dog parks. I know that's an issue of contention, um, but also spaces to activate art, also spaces to do outdoor theater and so many more un wonderful ideas. So I look forward to um, asking for a suspension and pass of the resolution just to support me in uh, recording that we have done th this work in order to, uh, again, uh, revitalize our business districts by way of activating parcels and also to creating open spaces and beautifying Roxbury. Thank you and thank you for your vote in advance. And thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to speak in this matter or would anyone like to add their name? Please raise your hand, Mr. Clerk. Please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baugh, Council Braden, Councilor Coletta, Council Lara, Council Mejia, Council Murphy. Council Worrell, please have the chair. Council Fernandez Anderson is seeking suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0632. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. We're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0633. Docket number 0633, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Fernandez. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0633. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0634. Docket number 0634, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Borg. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0634. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0635. Docket number 0635. Councilor Flynn. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0635. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am informed. I am informed by the clerk that there are six additional late file matters. These include absence letters, personnel orders, a resolution. The late file matter should be on everyone's desk. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a minute just to ensure that they are on everyone's desk. Three. Okay. We will take a, a vote to add these late file matters into the agenda. All those in favor <clears throat> of adding these late file matters into the agenda say aye. Thank you. These late file matters have been added into the agenda. Mr. Clerk, please read the first late file matter into the agenda, which is an absence letter. Letter from uh, City Councilor Frank Baker. Dear President Flynn, please be advised that I will not be in attendance at the Boston City Council meeting on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. Please ask the City Clerk to read this matter into the public record. Thank you, Councilor Frank Baker. This late file matter will be placed on file. Mr. Crook, the second um, late file matter is also an um, absence letter. Letter from Boston City Councilor Michael Flaherty. Dear Mr. Clark and Councilor, Council President Flynn, I write to inform you that I unfortunately am unable to make it to the meeting of the Boston City Council today, March 22nd, 2023. A member of my staff will be present to take notes and I'll review the recording of the meeting as soon as possible. I look forward to following up with colleagues and staff after the meeting. Sincerely, Councilor Mike Flaherty. Thank you. This late file matter will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, the next late file matter is a personnel order. 
Personnel Order, Council of Flynn for Council of Braden. The, cheeks, the Chair seeks suspension of rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, the, the next late file matter is also a personnel order. Personnel order, Council of Flynn for Council of Braden. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, the next late file matter is also a personnel order. Personnel order, Council Flynn for Council Worrell. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This late file matter has passed. Mr. Clerk, the last late file matter into the record is a resolution from Council Fernandez Anderson. Resolution offered by Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Resolution to acknowledge and celebrate March 27th as Criolas International Day, whereas Women's Organization of Cape Verde, OMCV, was founded in 1981. And in 1983, they proposed the day of March 27th to be Criolas International Day or International Cape Verdean Women's Day. And whereas be it resolved that the Boston City Council celebrates March 27th as Cape Verdean Women's Day and recognizes the contributions and achievements of Cape Verdean women in our city and around the world and encourages all residents to celebrate the rich cultural heritage of Cape Verdean Bostonians and to work towards creating a more equitable and inclusive community that supports the progress and empowerment of Cape Verdean women. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to take the time to um, thank, um, and that's okay, she'll uh, put me in a chokehold later, um, to uh, thank our very own uh, Chantel Barboza, who uh, brought this to my attention to <laughs> recognize and uplift all the Criadas in um, Boston. Um, as uh, Mr. Clerk has uh, read, Cape Verde Women Day um, is celebrated annually March 27 to recognize contributions and achievements of Cape Verde women around the world. Let me give you a little bit of history. At first, I was going to stand up and actually do a little like Batuku uh, song for you, but I don't know if you guys are ready for that. First of all, I would have to have some sort of like uh, t uh, towel to tie around my hips. It's sort of like hula dance a little bit, I guess faster, more hippie, but anyway, you get the picture. Um, in Cape Verde, knowingly that we were um, discovered uh, before uh, Columbus, Christopher Columbus time, and that our country, of an archipelago of 10 <laughs> islands was used as a port, a transatlantic slave trade port. And it was the island that I come from, Santiago, <clears throat> that was used actually for this uh, sort of trade. And as um, my people, the African people from the continent would get uh, kidnapped and then stolen and then a genocide, a, a journey of genocide would begin. One of, um, the, uh, one of the largest, I wouldn't say the largest because of course we have the indigenous and the Native American people, hundreds of millions of people, but this would then turn into about uh, 20 million people uh, as, a, as a holocaust. Uh, the, for the African Holocaust. Cape Verde then suffered famines every decade. If you can imagine, there are different islands and like in Jamaica where the rebels would go into the mountains to fight their colonizers and oppressors, that Cape, Cape, Verde, Cape Verdeans would do the same. So the Africans would go into the mountains and organize to fight um, the colonizers. And so we began this culture of just making way, making do of everything. So these strong, uh, diverse group of people, different countries would come to Cape Verde, such as, in, as you know, all of the continents. So the English, the Spaniards, the, even the Italians at some point, the Portuguese, the Germans, the Dutch, they would all come to Cape Verde to land their ships and then they would begin piracy later in the uh, later 1800s because um, who controlled, whoever controlled the port for slave, um, trans slave trade would control the world uh, slave trade. So 
we as rebels in the mountains and began to survive, but also suffering famines because there, was, there wasn't much to do. Cape Verde is a very dry land, sometimes very tropical, and sometimes very dry, months without rain even. So um, eventually we gained our independence after Amilcar Cabral um, ended up fighting with PAIGC and different um, African countries to be able to unite and fight the Portuguese and won. After his assassination, of course, we celebrate his independence, our Independence Day, 1975. But who was there but Titina Sila, a Cape Verdean woman from, Gu from Guinea originally who uh, fought alongside Emilka Cabral. Today, I wanted to pay respects to all of my criados in Sila. <laughs> And um, of course, thank you for your um, work, your tenacity, your brilliance, and your beauty, and of course, our warm heart. Um, I wouldn't do it justice if I didn't say it in Criollo, um, right? So um, before I get, I gotta take a deep breath, right? Um, Para toda mulher caverdiana que está na casa até hoje, e para aqueles que estão no caminho, que se atrasaram, como a irmã de crioulo, às vezes não está tarde, em que eu nós, mas hoje, em dedico aquele dia ali para nós, para a minha grande cresceu, minha irmãzinha um, Chantel Barbosa, trazer aquele ponto ali na minha atenção, para nos celebrar, para nos dar honra, para toda mulher caverdiana, para o dia de mulheres caverdianas, dia uh, 27 de março. Um cre aprecia nós e entenda nós honra e também para nos viver com dignidade, para nos começar a ser tratado com justiça e para nos pagar na cidade ali, justamente em cima esta paga que os outros. Um cre mesmo explica. Mas também, não que eu me preocupa, tudo que está falando em crioulo, está falando em inglês, nós é poderosa, nós é inteligente, nós já não contribui dentro daquele país ali, não está fazendo tudo coisa, nós é o país mais limpo, um dos países mais limpos do mundo, já não alcança o seu décimo mil cabral para hoje, e hoje está falando nós, mas está precisando nós, a mim é quem que me é, para morrer de nós, e está falando nós, muito obrigada, está amando nós, está criando nós, a minha criada, poderosa, sim, a nós, que o seu orgulho. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. <laughs> Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just want to extend one of my congratulations to all of the Cape Verdean women at City Hall and to Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Um, my youngest brother, Manuel, is half Cape Verdean. His dad is Cape Verdean. And he is the only boy in the family. So I inherited six Cape Verdean half sisters <laughs> and a grandmother, Miss Natalia, who unfortunately <coughs> taught my mother how to say calabaca. And that's all. <laughs> and that is uh, how my mom used to yell at my little brother in the house all of the time. And, and I say that to say that um, I have in my life been blessed um, to really have that warm heart and, and that care and that love from Cape Verdean women through, through my family and my little brother. And so I'm happy to celebrate. And I please add my name to the resolution. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I, you know, every time I hear Councilor Anderson speak, it always makes me also um, get choked up because I see how much you have, just how much love you have for the people that you serve um, and the people that you represent. And I think that sometimes we leave so much of ourselves at the door so that we could be in this chamber. So I just, just want to thank you for your vulnerability and for your humility. Because um, I know it's not easy to be you or us in any of these spaces. So I just want to say thank you for that um, because it takes a lot of courage to show up. And I also just wanted to uplift that, you know, having grown up here in the city of Boston in the early 80s, I used to work at Tom McCann's shoe store and I had a lot of Cape Verdeans roll up through there. Um, and you are clapping because you probably are wearing the shoes that I sold you, girl. Yes. Um, and I always used to say that I was from uh, Fogo. I have not knowing where the Fogo was, but they, the Cape Verdeans adopted me um, and taught me how to say a few things. And one of the things that I learned how to say is boque con pamella. 
I don't know what, but it was, do you want to buy socks and obrigada? And just like understanding the immigrant experience and understanding what it's like to be a woman, a woman of immigrant descent and having to learn how to be in a country that oftentimes did not see you or value you or accept you. And it was in that right vein and being an immigrant myself, it was my immigrant Kirola uh, sisters that taught me that we are all one. And I just want to say thank you for your leadership, Councilor Anderson, and for how hard you work to making sure that all people here in the city of Boston are seen, heard, and felt. And so happy Criolia Day. Please add my name and keep bringing all of that spicy sauce into this chamber. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair is going back to Council uh, fernandez Anderson. Council fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to rise to also acknowledge that um, Senator Liz Miranda um, was, is on her way. Uh, unfortunately, um, this was uh, a, a short notice uh, for her, but she, of course, is accommodating our schedule. I wanted to also ask everyone to join us in the Piemonte room for some good, delicious Cape Verdean food um, um, after this. Um, and again, thank you, thank you, everyone. And um, I also wanted to uplift Senator Miranda for being the first Cape Verdean um, state rep and the first Cape Verdean state senator. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean. Thank you. Just rising as well to just say happy Creole International Day to uh, Cape Verdean women. Cape Verdeans are an integral part of our city. Um, it's always weird to go to other places and people not know what it means to be Cape Verdean or like where Cape, like Cape Verdeans are so integral to Boston. Um, I lived in Senegal with a family that was Cape Verdean and so I don't remember the name of the dance but I know that like it was part of the ritual when uh, families were getting married, when uh, my host sister was getting married. So just, um, I'm just grateful to the Cape Verdean community, Haitian person, there's been so much in common culturally, um, and I just am and grateful for what I learned from you, from the culture that you bring to the city, for the, for the food, for the pastelas. So thank you, obrigada, um, and happy Criola International Day. Thank you. Thank you, Council Ujain. Um, if you'd like to add your name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clark, please add. Councilor Bach, Councilor Royo, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jean, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell. Please add the chair. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of this late file matter. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Yeah, we'll, we'll do one after the, um, after the, the session's over. Um, we're on to green sheets. We're on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're going to do a combination of announcements and memorials at this time. If anyone would like to speak about a, a, a loved one or a constituent or a family member that has passed away, um, please raise your hand or if you would like to make a brief announcement as well, please raise your hand. I'll go around the around the room, starting with Council Arroyo. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to uh, shine some light on Cruz Miguel Ortiz Cuadra, who uh, I have submitted as a name uh, to close memory of. He's a food historian uh, who's known as a, one of Puerto Rico's leading gastronomy experts, uh, and he sought to define the island's cuisine and educate the world about it. Uh, he died uh, this month in Puerto Rico. His books and research uh, have been used to find solutions to Puerto Rico's generally acknowledged food insecurity problems, uh, which stem from the island's reliance on imported products. He worked on a project to help identify native and naturalized ingredients uh, in order to preserve and propagate them. Uh, chefs use his work in, in, on Puerto Rican ingredients today uh, to curate their menus and to have their staffs explain the dishes uh, that are sort of Puerto Rico's national dishes. Uh, he not only taught 
as a Puerto Rican culinary history certification program. He also helped former students create projects that would help lead the island to food independence. And he's had strong relationships with restaurateurs, chefs, mom and pop shops, farmers, and home cooks, both here uh, on the mainland and in Puerto Rico. Uh, and so he, his passing uh, leaves a void and he will be missed. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Mr. President. Um, and I uh, actually rise on a cheerful occasion today. Um, it is my uh, younger sister, Abby's uh, 32nd birthday. Um, so I wanted to wish her happy birthday. Um, she is one year, nine months younger than me. So this is, we're in the three month period where it looks like we're only a year apart, um, uh, even though I've always been older and wiser. Um, she's, uh, but just like someone who's unbelievably close to me, really an amazing person. I'm very proud of her. She's about to graduate with her MBA in a month, um, living down in Philadelphia these days, but she still keeps up with everything going on in Boston. Um, and uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, the, I love her a lot and I wanted to wish her a happy birthday. So thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Pre Mr. President. Um, the, last year, I had the pleasure of celebrating Corrine Gilbert's uh, 100th birthday. We recognized her in City Council last year. Um, she was surrounded by family and friends and was elegant and engaged as always, 100 years old. Um, she lived independently uh, and took care of herself, was an incredible baker and, and, and cook uh, in, the, uh, in her home. Uh, in, in Brighton, and uh, then her health declined quite rapidly in, in May of last year, and uh, she passed away last week. Uh, 100 years, an incredible uh, presence in our community. She was a very special woman, musically talented, active in her local synagogue and at the local PTA when she had children. Uh, she recorded uh, her StoryCorps interview with her grandson Jonah, uh, that is preserved in the Library of Congress, and it's a really interesting conversation that they had, and it's a, it's a treasure to have that memory preserved. Uh, she was a bright light in the Brighton community and will be dearly missed by all who knew her. And I, I want to remember her today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I have two things. One, just wanted to send my condolences to St. Teresa's in West Roxbury. Just last week we lost uh, Reverend Peter Nolan and we will be sending him home this week. Uh, Father Nolan was incredibly dedicated to the community, many, many decades of work, not just here in Boston and in West Roxbury, but um, all across the world really um, with his missionary work. So I just wanted to extend my condolences to St. Teresa's and his friends and family. And I also just wanted to welcome, I have two of my friends visiting here, Councillor Willie Burnley Jr., Councillor at Large from Somerville, and Councillor Burhan Azim, Councillor at Large from Cambridge, who are here with us today. Just wanted to shout them out. Th thank you, Councillor Lara, and welcome to the City Council uh, Councillors. The Chair recognizes Councillor Louis Jean. Councillor Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Just wanted to <coughs> remind my uh, Council colleagues about the Lunch and Learn in uh, the Curly Room uh, by Boston Community Land Trust, uh, Minnie McMahon, Lydia Lowe, and a few others will be here following up on the AOP conversation that we had um, during hearing a few weeks ago. So hope everyone can join. There will be Haitian food, so you can jump from the Curly Room to get ha Haitian food, and then from Monte Room to get Cape Verdean food. So, all right. Thank, thank you, Councilor Louis Jean. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. I just wanted to uh, give my daughter, Annalise, uh, a shout out. She made the JV uh, softball team. Um, and she also made the JV uh, last uh, session, uh, the basketball team. And so, you know, I really do appreciate Councilor Murphy and her um, steadfast advocacy around athletics. You know, I really think it's such a great source of providing young young people with the um, mental health and wellness that they need to. So I just wanted to uplift Annalise since, you know, I work 13, 14 hours a day and this child um, in many ways feels neglected by me, but I'm glad she's at least thriving um, in school despite it all. So I just want to give her a shout out and uplift her. And, um, and she's also made the honor roll um, every semester. So I just wanted to sing her praises while I have the privilege to do so. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Mejia, and 
I'm just going to run through some of the names that are mentioned for Councilor Arroyo. As he mentioned, Cruz Miguel Ortiz, Councilor Braden, Corrine Gil Council Braden, Corrine Gilbert, Council Coletta, Coletta, Jamie Lee, LaGrasse Boucher. For Council Fernandez Anderson, Carol Ian Hairston. For Council is Flynn, Flaherty, and Baker, Kevin Ostergai. For Council Flynn and Flaherty, Monsignor Albert Contons from the St. Peter's Lithuanian Church in South Boston. For Council Lara and, and for myself, I, I also knew um, Father Peter Nolan very well. Uh, for Council Louis Jen, Vlad, Jimeno, Adonis, Rollin, Maynard, Freeman. For Councilors Murphy, Baker, Flynn and Flaherty, James Wall, Jimmy Driscoll, and before we adjourn, I do want to recognize Robert Francis Hannon Sr. as last week mentioned by Councilor Arroyo. Robert was a longtime City Hall staffer. He served in the City Council under three mayors. He was a Boston City Council, Boston City Hall beat reporter for the Herald, covering mayors Hines, Collins, and White before moving to the Mass State House to cover statewide politics. Robert was the research director for the City Council and retired in that role. He was active in his neighborhood, as, as Councilor Royal mentioned, in High Park and has contributed so much to the community. I was asked to inform the public that tonight, Robert's Wake, actually Robert's Wake will be on Friday, March 24th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the McDonald Cohane Funeral Home in North Weymouth. For all of these, a moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when we adjourn today, we do so in the memory of those individuals we mentioned here today. We are scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, March 29th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the clerk and the clerk's team. I want to say thank you to my colleagues and their staff. I want to say thank you to the City Council Central staff and say thank you to the court stenographer as well. All in favor of adjournment, please, adjournment, please say aye. Aye. The council is adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Yep. Could could we all come to the podium for a photograph, please?